I want to follow up actually on a couple of themes of this, which are written about in Understanding Socialism by Richard Wolff, Order It Today. One, and, and it's funny, I just got off, the, uh, just finished recording an interview, which will come out for patrons this Sunday. And I think we might release later because, I mean, because all of uh, this conversation with Vijay Prashad and we were talking about how India is mobilizing against absolutely a neo-fascist government. There's no other way of describing uh, what is happening with regards to the Muslim population and so on. But Vijay also pointed out that this is not only a, you know, there's some attention now with the siege on Kashmir and how Muslims are being targeted, but this is an aggressively capitalist and neoliberal government. And in fact, the IMF chief economist was just in India basically saying, you guys need to slow up on the impression of Muslims and speed up on the destruction of organized labor. Right. And he said, and what's very encouraging is that in India, millions of people are rising up and, and also people are, you know, upwards of 20 something students have been killed by police and security forces because the other thing they're doing is they're gutting public education and trying to get people out of student housing. This is another project of the Modi government. And he said, the inverse in India is true of the United States. And that's how I want to try to bridge this. But he said, you know, in the United States, you really do have energy and momentum around Bernie Sanders. And then that's, and then you don't necessarily have a movement yet, para, you know, outside of electoral politics. In India, he said, the problem is the opposite. There isn't a vehicle yet in, uh, in electoral politics that corresponds with the organic energy that's emerging on the street. And we talked about that. And so what I wonder about the United States and in juxtaposing it with India and obviously with France, and this is a question that people ask all the time, and it's the really simple one. And I think you address it somewhere in the book. Why can't that happen here? You see people in France, you see this happening, and there is this notion, which by the way might be a total myth, that Americans don't protest and strike in the same way, that there isn't the quote unquote culture for it. And I guess the Quick question I'd ask you on top of that, well, a couple, is that really true? And secondly, to the, is it either that it isn't true and there's actually a hidden repressed history of strikes and protests in America, or to the extent it is true, how much do we need to understand just how violent the repression has been in America from the Pinkertons to the apartheid South even through, not as severe, obviously, but my understanding is that Occupy was destroyed through a coordinated state apparatus effort. The Department of Homeland Security under Obama was coordinating with local governments and cities across the country. It was ruthless from New York to Oakland. So can it happen here? Has it happened here more than we realize? And do we have to think about some of the repressive apparatuses of the United States that are maybe even more extreme than in France, although there's been some violence in France too, but yeah. Well, I think things are less different around the world than they ever have been, which is uh, right. the other side of globalization and all the rest of it. Um, if, in, if it's true to say of India, and I see the point, that they have a lot of movement, but they don't have the political party to express it, then I would say that's true in France as well, that they don't have. The Communist Party might once have done it, but can't do it now. The Socialist Party might once have done it and can't do it now. The anti-capitalist parties that have emerged in the last 20 years in France could perhaps, but they're not at that point now. So they're like India. They have movement. Well, the Yellow Vest is a very powerful movement. And now this general strike, even more. And both of them are more left-wing than they are anything else. I mean, there are right-wing people involved, by the way, particularly in the Yellow Vest right. and to some degree in the unions. But it's a much more, the, the whole culture of it is left. Uh, so... I think here in the United States, we have a little bit of both. We also don't have a political expression because the only way so far that there has seemed to be a chance for a political expression 
has been the Democratic Party, which is as much a repressive force against that as it is the only place to try to do it. And that contradiction right. remains central to everything we see. I mean, look how they're treating Bernie and so forth, and look at the reaction to AOC. Um, the difference in France and the United States, if I can talk about it, get at please, it that way, please. is in France there is, and I know this is dangerous language, but there, I don't know any other way to say it, there is a cultural continuing struggle. People who are left-wing in France whatever their particular interpretations, are self-conscious that they're that, they want to be that, they want to get those ideas out there, whether they're you know, an industrial worker or a school teacher or a student, they feel part of something that is important in their culture to maintain. And if they get the sense that a radio program or a newspaper is hostile to that, they will find someone else to listen to or something else to read because they understand what that is. That's taken their country in that direction, and they don't want to go in that direction. You don't find that in the United States on that kind of a scale. We, 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 have, we have bought as a nation much more into the notion, in most cases, that there's something neutral about education, or there's mm. something mm. neutral about culture that we are all together, you know, it's it's only on the right that you have more of the militant we are, Christian fundamentalist right, right way. Those folks have more of this, which has now served them real well, and which Mr. Trump has captured. And, In a neo-fascistic way. Yes. Yep. But they have that cultural reproduction, particularly in those parts of the country where they are right. numerous and can do a lot of things. and But you don't see it on the other side in anything like the same sort of self-conscious uh, uh, manner. Um, and even when it does express itself, it tends to be very what we call in, in, in psychology victimology. It, it's we are the oppressed groups. In France, we're not the oppressive groups. We're the fighting. It's a different mentality. We're not being hurt. We're not looking for the person who's going to protect us. The Christian evangelicals in the in the South see Mr. Trump as a protector. He portrays himself as a protector. He's going to protect you from the onslaughts of the immigrants. He's going to protect you from the Chinese and other foreigners who are cheating you. And that's going to bring back your job. It's sort of magical, but it's the notion of a protector for a victimized or threatened. The cultural left in, in France is a, a different... We have an idea, they say, of how this country ought to be and how it ought to develop. And that's, and you don't have to agree with us, but then we don't have much to do with you because we're going to work with people who understand that that's what makes this country. We're here to win. Great. That's we're here right. to win. And look at what we've won. Look at our pensions. Look at our program for an adult to travel with a child. That that isn't left uh, for the parent to either be or not be. What? It's like when you have a, a new baby in, in France, within a month or two, you're immediately given a social worker to help you as a young mother or a young couple uh, deal with your child. It's, it's part of the social welfare program. It's something we take care of our children. In the literal sense of it takes a village rather than advertising copy, it's a different mentality, and that mentality is what enables moments like this to happen in France. It's suddenly, it goes like wildfire. They're going to hurt our pensions. And 8 million phone calls happen. And in those phone calls, John tells his cousin, Louis, and Mary calls her sister-in-law and says, this is, this is an attack on everything we have achieved. This is not the France we want to live in. Don't let them do that to us. And that produces a social glue that makes not, not only the people who go out on strike. And by the way, just a footnote. 
the police are on strike in Paris also. Really? Because some of the, the footage, strike. okay, that's very significant. Because some yep. of the footage that had come out earlier, had yes. been, the police had been well, very the, the French. Had, there's two kinds of police in France. There's right. a gendarme as a local cop, right. and then there's the national security. Right. You can guess which one. <laughs> they can guess which one is <laughs> Which one English. is which. Right. But right. the right. point is, public servants, ballet dancer, the strikes are proliferating more and more because everybody sees that this is about. So is this the engine? So you and I have talked, and I want to be really careful with this because, again, I'll say, as I always say, I think Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign in the context of where our United States is right now, material, social, every other condition, could not be more important in every way, shape, and form, from minimizing suffering to the much broader goals of actually, I'll say, graduating from capitalism. I like that terminology. Now, translating between having a politics that's real and has a relationship with the ground and is down to earth now, and then also recognizing that the very simple propositions. Can we have capitalism indefinitely in the future and have a survivable earth? I think we all know any, I mean, look, no, no, we cannot practice capitalism as we do and survive as a species, let alone produce good outcomes for people who actually are living here and now uh, in, in, the, in the large sense. When we talk about why reform is really insufficient now, not just as a that's our preference, but like we're actually running out of time and the old formulas won't work. And then when you talk about democracy at work, how we actually democratize the economy, move into the next phase of things. If you see what's happening in France, I mean, is that is that a launching point potentially for something new? Or is it a, is it a valiant effort to save what has been achieved before from the neoliberal onslaught? Or is it a profession, potential door for the types of transitions we're talking about. How do those transitions actually happen in the 21st century in it's today's right, conditions? It's the right question. It, but to, to be as honest as I know how, absolutely what the French are doing is trying to protect the social democracy that they created, that the labor movement took the lead, that the socialist and communist parties took the lead, they deserve the credit. Only in the United States is it necessary to pretend Otherwise, just like, by the way, the socialist and communist parties in this country <laughs> they deserve a lot too. of credit for right. social security, right. unemployment compensation, and all the other Thank you, Eugene things. Debs. Yes, yes, and all yeah. of that. And all of that. Uh, but you're right. It's a movement to protect. But that culture is teaching the French, and I think in a minute I'll try to tell you why I think it's teaching us here in America, too, that... Every effort to establish social democratic norms, free education. Let's remember, you go to the university in France, you don't pay hardly anything. You go to the university in Germany, you literally pay nothing because they've canceled all tuition, all fees. Those are achievements of the working classes in those countries to get that done. Anyway, their discovery... May I just say really briefly, I hope... I they are achievements. There's a myth here that it's like, well, because Europe got abundant and they chose to do those things. Yeah. And they're nicer than we are because we're abundant too, but we didn't choose to do those things versus those things had to be struggled for in Europe just Absolutely. like anywhere else. Absolutely. Yes. Look, it's a genius of capitalism. Right. You fight these demands. You fight against the minimum wage. You fight against public education. You fight against... You, and then when you lose because of mass people, you then, it's clever, you then turn <laughs> around and say, aren't we wonderful? <laughs> My colleagues these days, very popular among economists to say, you know, don't be so critical of capitalism. 200 years ago, look how people lived, the proportion of people in poverty was blah, 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 and now <laughs> it's much less. Uh, I look at them with stunned disbelief <laughs> You're selling, telling me I should support the what the system that fought against that at every step had to be confronted, had to be fought against. People died, went to jail, went into exile, fighting for these 
progressive steps, and now you want to fool me into thinking you gave us this out of the generosity? You don't give us anything out of generosity. <laughs> you never did. That's not the way you play. That's not the game you got. So this is grotesquerie, but clever to make it appear as though what was forced out of you by struggle was in fact given to you uh, as largesse of the capitalist system. That's, by the way, what is exactly one of the dynamics in Saudi Arabia right now with regards to a different issue, but it's so connected. The, when the Western press, before he mutilated or allegedly had Shoghi mutilated, and they were giving MBS all the credit in the world, and he was hanging out with Bloomberg and with Mark Zuckerberg and The Rock. One of the things they would always say is, well, he gave women the right to drive. He's improving women's rights in Saudi Arabia. That is true. However, he was putting the woman who led those movements into prison because the point was, was not that these women risked their lives and well-being to fight for rights. The point was, the prince gave you a gift. And it reinforces the system. Yes. Yeah. It's like you fight for full employment. Right. And you force it. And the and the, the capitalist who fought that every step of the way wants you to now to refer to him as a job creator. <laughs> you you got to be kidding. Right. Anyway, let's go back. Okay. So, yes, you're protecting. But here is the harsh lesson that the working class is now learning. You will never be secure in whatever social democratic gains you make, as long as you leave in place a core of people with the incentive to undo what you've achieved and the resources to achieve your undoing. Nothing illustrates that better than Mr. Macron in the French government. He's trying to take away the standard of living they've achieved, the pensions they paid for and achieved. He's doing that because French capitalism is in trouble and there has to be a rearrangement. And as French capitalism declines, it's very clear who wants to stay rich and powerful and who is therefore going to have to pay the bill of the declining capitalism. And that's what the issue is. Who's going to pay? And what the working class is learning is that whoever's in power, if you don't take a step beyond social reform, all of that, even when you win, and often you don't, but even when you win, the next morning, the undoing project commences, and the same people who tried to prevent you from getting it will now undo it. The last 50 years, switch the United States, the last 50 years has been the systematic undoing of the New Deal. The New Deal, look, it came at a moment of capitalist collapse, 1929 and everything that happened, and you had at that time, in the United States, as in every other country, a split. Those who wanted reform and those who wanted a revolution. Remember, 1929 is only 12 years after the revolution in Russia. Everybody knew about a revolution in Russia that had succeeded, had had the revolution, had withstood the attack of the Western countries, including the United States, withstood the Civil War, came out of World War I and with a new, what have they called, socialist communist government. So that was real. And in the struggle between Roosevelt, representing the community, the business community, and the socialist communists and the CIO, the, the people from below, the question was reform or revolution, as it always is. And revolution was defeated. Reform was what we got. So we got social security, unemployment compensation, first minimum wage, and a federal jobs program, I mean, to focus on the big four. Okay, we got that. That's like social democracy. We got it. But what we didn't do was prevent the forces that are committed to undoing it from being preserved, being preserved in their position as the capitalists who own the enterprises and draw the profits of work into their hands. And they have used those profits ever since to undo the New Deal, to make the minimum wage a joke of insufficiency, to get rid of uh, the whole idea of public employment as a national commitment. I mean, we just went through a crisis, didn't even discuss it as a real uh, 
uh, option, and we're trying to erode Social Security and unemployment compensation. They've done a really good job. But there's a lesson in this, and I don't think history will allow us to not draw that lesson. And the lesson is, yes, revolution was defeated, we got reform. And we have learned that reform without revolution is inherently insecure and will be taken back. And I think, even though many people couldn't put it into words, the following is the conclusion that working classes, American as well as French, have drawn, and that confront Bernie. The working class is not about to go out and fight for the next 10 years to establish another New Deal, a green one this time, and then confront having not taken the steps to prevent it from being undone the way the le- they're not. If you ask them to struggle for social democracy, they're going to say to you in so many words, we're not doing it because we've been there and we've done that and it doesn't work. We are not going to do that again. Well, then what would they do? They would take a step if it meant the reforms plus the removal of the capacity of the capitalist class to undo it. it it's the same thing. It's, when, when Abraham Lincoln signs the, the, the Emancipation Proclamation, he is saying to the South, we're not just going to defeat you in a civil war. We are going to make sure that there is no slavery. You're not going to be able to use slaves to accumulate wealth to reestablish the slavery we just. That's why Marx you. thought it was a revolutionary That's war. That's right. That Marx was what was a revolutionary war could have happened. It could right. have. It right. should have. And, and it and did. I mean, what's and of course it did happen. In, in that way, way, it did. After Reconstruction, it, it, they did recreate a right. feudal. But they could never get. But they the slavery get the, right. was over. Right. The slavery. And as long was, as the North was there occupying, I mean, it could have made the, the gone in a different direction. But look at the lesson. You defeated the South by saying to them in the end, slavery is over and you cannot have it. There will be no slaves. And that made sure that whatever the South did, recreating slavery, they could not do. They could get close. They could have Jim Crow. They could have the new slavery of incarceration. I get all that. But you couldn't do it again. You had to find ways within capitalism because that was not right, negotiable. Right, that was the transition. Well, the, the, transition right. the lesson I want to see people draw, and I want to see Bernie draw, is look, you've got to go to the working class, honestly, and say, I'm not repeating history. I am not the person leading you into another new deal to have it then undone. I'm telling you, we're going to go for a new deal, but we're going to combine it with the equivalent of an emancipation rocket. There is no more capitalism. There aren't going to be a small number, a 1%, who sits at the top of the pyramid of the economy, gathering the forces and the, and the resources to keep itself in a position of power, which in the end undoes those reforms. That's the game. And we're not going to rely on them to to go along with it. We've just been through a 50-year history in every part of the world that achieved reform out of the Great Depression. That reform has been attacked, undermined, and reduced. More in the United States and Britain than in continental Europe because they're stronger in Europe to hold on to it, but they're facing it too. From Sweden in the north to Italy in the south— The differences are questions of degree, but the assault on the social democracy is everywhere. On the other hand, just to be intellectually fair, uh, John Mackey, the former CEO of Whole Foods, (laughs) has said that there's such a thing as conscious capital. I'm sorry, I can't even even finish the joke. John Mackey's very annoying. Watch uh, the debate that he did with it. It was such a bad debate that I... (laughs) I can never get organic pomegranates there again. So (laughs) thank you, Professor Wolf. Uh, Everybody, buy this book, Understanding Socialism. Professor Wolf is going to continue to be with us in the post game. You just watched a Michael Brooks show video. Subscribe to get them all. Why wouldn't you? Don't be foolish. Click subscribe below and become a patron as well. Patreon.com slash TMBS. Thanks, everybody.